All right, well, why don't we get started? Greetings, everyone. My name is Chris Wold. I teach at the Los Lewis and Clark Law School. Thank you for being here for the presentation by Lewis and Clark's 2021 Distinguished International Law Visitor. Each year, the law school's International Law Committee invites a luminary in the field of international law to talk to our students, faculty, and larger community. This year, of course, we were not able to arrange an actual visit, but we are delighted to have Philippe Sands join us from London via Zoom. We begin this and all of our events with a land acknowledgement. Lewis and Clark College is located in Portland, Oregon in Multnomah County. Prior to the newcomers coming to this area, the indigenous land of this area was home to many tribal people. Today, we honor the indigenous people on whose traditional and ancestral homelands we stand. The Multnomah, Kathlamet, Clackamas, Tumwater, and Watlala bands of the Chinook, the Tualatin, Kalapuya, and many other indigenous nations of the Columbia River. It is, <coughs> excuse me, it is important to acknowledge the ancestors of this place and to recognize that we are here because of the sacrifices forced upon them. In remembering these communities, we honor their legacy, their lives, and their descendants. A few housekeeping notes. The Oregon State Bar has approved this presentation for one general MCLE credit. To receive that credit uh, for, for attending today's webinar, you need to fill out the Google form. Uh, you have a link provided to you in the event announcement uh, for this presentation. Today's webinar is being recorded and will be uploaded to the law school's YouTube channel so that you and others can uh, watch it later. There will be a question and answers uh, at the end of Philippe's presentation. There'll be a little Q&A icon uh, at the bottom of your screen. Uh, and I will uh, review the, the questions and present them uh, to Philippe uh, later in the presentation. I also want to thank Powell's Books for co-sponsoring the event. If you go to the event website, you can find a link uh, directly to Philippe's most recent book, The Rat Line, which he is going to discuss with us today. With that out of the way, I now have the honor and pleasure of introducing our 2021 Distinguished International Law Visitor, Philippe Sands. Philippe is currently a professor of laws and director of the Center on International Courts and Tribunals at University College London, University of London. He is also the co-director of the Project on International Courts and Tribunals. He's a barrister with the Matrix Chambers uh, and the president of English Pen, a human rights organization. His expertise crosses international law disciplines and includes international environmental law, public international law, human rights law, the law of war, and, and others. He's written dozens of books and articles on all of these topics, uh, including uh, East West Street on the origins of genocide and crimes against humanity which despite its name is a tremendously engaging look, not only at the two men responsible for developing those two legal concepts, but also uh, it's a personal account of his, of his own family's history during the Holocaust. The New York Times called this book brilliant and deeply moving, uh, an assessment which I wholeheartedly agree with. This and other expertise has brought Philippe to the attention of numerous governments which have asked him to represent them before the International Court of Justice, the International Tribunal on the Law of the Sea, the World Trade Organization, uh, and many others. Uh, these cases include high profile cases such as the nuclear weapons case, whaling in the Antarctic, armed activities in the Congo, and many, many others. I could go on such as Philippe's extraordinary career. Uh, I do know one, one omission uh, to his CV though, uh, more than 30 years ago, he helped supervise an eager and young law student, uh, myself, while I learned the ropes uh, of practicing international environmental law uh, as a student extern with the Center for International Environmental Law, uh, one of the organizations which Philippe helped start. Uh, with that, I turn it over to you, Philippe. 
Chris, thank you so much. It's incredibly nice to see you. It's incredibly nice to be virtually in Oregon. I wish I was there in person. I'm actually speaking to you from London, England. Uh, I hope to be back in Oregon. I've been on numerous occasions to universities, but also with family uh, as we are an Anglo-American uh, family. Uh, I am an international lawyer and I'm an international law academic. I'm gonna talk mostly today about my new book, which is out this week. And I am particularly excited because this is the first ever US event on the book. I've got a whole raft more coming up in the next few weeks, but this is the first. So for me, it's especially nice to be with you. But in the q and I'm happy to talk about the issues I'm talking about now or any other issue that you wanna talk about that's related to some of the cases or crimes against humanity and genocide and environment or whatever. It's really entirely up to you, particularly those words are addressed to the student uh, community uh, amongst you. These are immensely difficult times. I know that from my students and from my own kids and uh, you are entitled to expect from us to, to help you in any way that we can. Some of you may have read my book East West Street, although I suspect none of you have yet got around uh, to the rat line. And the two sets of stories that they tell, like the cases in which I'm involved in international courts, inevitably involve personal stories. And I suppose what I've come to be really interested in is that special connection between the minutiae of personal stories and the bigger canvas of the big political, legal, public story. That's what really interests me. I think I can say that East West Street and the Rat Line are part of a broader project, helping make international law reach a broader audience. And that's incredibly important right now, not least in the United Kingdom and the United States, two countries which have in a sense, moved away from their commitment in 1945 to a rules-based global order. In reaching out, I've met some extraordinary people. And two of the people that I've met in the past decade are the sons of two leading Nazis who were directly involved in the extermination of my grandfather's family. Nicholas Frank, the son of Hans Frank, Adolf Hitler's personal lawyer, and Horst Wächter, the son of Otto Wächter, who was Frank's deputy governor of Krakow and of Galicia. I met them unexpectedly. I wasn't looking for their personal stories. The context was as follows. If you go back to the 1960s, my brother and I would often visit our grandparents who lived in Paris. As children, we came to understand that for our grandparents, the past was painful and that we shouldn't ask too many questions. It was a place of silences, a place haunted by secrets. I only really began to understand what had happened about those silences 10 years ago when I reached the age of 50. I got an invitation to deliver a public lecture in a city called Lviv in Ukraine. Would I come and talk about the cases that I do before international courts and tribunals on crimes against humanity and genocide? And so I went to Lviv and one thing led to another. I looked for and I found the house where my grandfather Leon was born in 1904. I learned of the terrible events that occurred there, unleashed by the words of Hans Frank, who was the governor general of Nazi-occupied Poland, spoken in August 1942 to his deputy, Otto Wächter, who had recently transferred to Lemberg, where he was the governor of Galicia. It was Hans Frank's words that began the process that led to the extermination of my grandfather's entire family and hundreds of thousands of other Jewish and Polish families. Hans Frank was charged with crimes against humanity and genocide, and he was hanged in the courtyard of Nuremberg's Palace of Justice exactly 75 years ago for crimes against humanity. I did also learn that the man who put crimes against humanity into international law, renowned Professor Hirsch Lauterpacht, happened to come from Lviv. Indeed, he was a student at the university that invited me although those who did invite me were blissfully unaware of that fact. And then I learned that the man who invented the word genocide, Raphael Lemkin, also passed through Lviv and was also a student at the same law faculty, although not at the same time as Lauterpacht. And the folks who invited me didn't know that either. And then I learned that at the Nuremberg trial, the famous trial, 
Lauter Pact and Lemkin actually prosecuted on behalf of the British and the Americans, Hans Frank, for crimes against humanity and genocide. But when the trial opened on the 20th of November 1945, they did not know that the man they were prosecuting was responsible for the deaths of their entire families also. You really couldn't invent it. Six years after that first visit to Lviv, I published East West Street, which isn't about the life of four in one individual, but four. It seeks to understand how the particular circumstances of the four, my grandfather, Lauterpacht, Lemkin, Frank, each contributed to the roads that he took and how their different roads changed the system of international law. That's my daily work and the daily work of so many others. Those of you who've read the book will know that it also touches on a more personal theme, how these four interweaving lives influence the path that I've taken directly and indirectly. And below my path and your paths lurk some pretty big questions, questions that touch each of us. And they address central questions of identity, which is very relevant right now in the US and in Europe. Who am I? And how do I want to be defined in law as an individual? or as a member of one or more groups? And how do I want the law to protect me as an individual or as a member of a group? It may have been my work as a barrister rather than my writings that caused the invitation to be sent from Lviv. In the summer of 1998, I'd been peripherally involved in the negotiations in Rome that led to the creation of an international criminal court with jurisdiction over genocide and crimes against humanity and two other crimes. The essential difference between the two concepts is on who is protected and why. If 10,000 people are killed, murdered, exterminated, their systematic killing will always be a crime against humanity. But will it be a genocide? That depends on the intention of the killers and the ability of prosecutors to prove that intention. To establish the crime of genocide, you ought to prove that the act of killing is motivated by a special intent the intent to destroy a group in whole or in part. If a criminal prosecutor can't prove that a large number of people have been killed with that intent, then the crime of genocide is not established under international law. So basically you've got these two crimes operating side by side and overlapping. Every genocide is also a crime against humanity, but not every crime against humanity is a genocide. A few weeks after the two crimes were inscribed into the ICC statute, Senator Augusto Pinochet was arrested in London on charges actually of genocide and crimes against humanity laid by a Spanish prosecutor. The House of Lords ruled that even as a former president of Chile, he was not entitled to claim immunity from the English courts. And that was a novel, if not revolutionary judgment. And in the years that followed after 98, the gates of international justice slowly creaked open after five decades of quiet during the Cold War chill that dissented after Nuremberg. Cases from the former Yugoslavia and Rwanda soon landed on my desk in London. Others followed on allegations in the Congo, Libya, Chechnya, Iran, Syria, Lebanon, Sierra Leone, Guantanamo, Palestine, Israel, Iraq, and so the list goes on. They were always based on the rules that came into being after 1945, an American invention, a revolutionary moment in the making of modern international law, a moment that began in courtroom 600 of Nuremberg's Palace of Justice, when it was recognized for the first time that the rights of the sovereign over its people are not unlimited. The long and sad list of cases that reached me reflected the failure of good intentions aired by Robert Jackson in courtroom 600. Never again, he said on the first day of the trial. I became involved in many cases of mass killing. I have seen many mass graves. Some of the cases were crimes against humanity, the killing of individuals on a large scale. Others were about genocide, the destruction of groups. These two distinct crimes with their different emphases on the individual and the group grew side by side, although over time, genocide seems to have emerged in the eyes of many as the crime of crimes, a hierarchy that leaves a suggestion that the killing of large number of people as individuals rather than as a group is somehow less terrible. 
One of the major characters in East West Street is Hans Frank's son, Nicholas. He's a very fine journalist and a writer, and he despises his father. The first time I met him, he said to me, you know, Philippe, I'm against the death penalty in all cases, except in the case of my father. After a few months, he introduced me to Horst Arthur Wächter, the son of his father's deputy, Otto Wächter, an Austrian, and also a cultured and highly educated lawyer who had become governor of Krakow and then of Galicia, based in Lviv. Wächter, the father, was indicted for mass murder, more than 100,000 Poles and Jews, but unlike Frank, he was never caught. He died in Rome in 1949 in the arms of a Vatican bishop in mysterious and unexpected circumstances. Nicholas said to me, Philippe, you will like Horst, although he is different from me, he loves his father. And so in the spring of 2012, I make the first of many visits to Horst, to the dilapidated ancient 12th century castle in the tiny village of Hagenberg, north of Vienna. Horst, who's in his early 70s, is genial and chatty. He wears a pink shirt and Birkenstocks. We talk, we eat, we drink. He speaks of his parents' Nazi beliefs, his love for his mother, Charlotte. She was a Nazi until the day she died, Horst's wife Jacqueline will whisper into my ear. And he had a childhood of plenty. Horst says of himself, I was a Nazi child. I was named in honor of the Horst Vessel song and Arthur Seiss Ingvart, who ran Austria briefly after the Anschluss and then became governor of German occupied Holland until 1945. He was Horst's godfather. Horst has a photograph of him hanged at Nuremberg just after Frank next to his bed. And Horst will say, you know what, Philippe, I hardly knew my father, but it's my duty as a son to find the good in him. On that first visit, Horst shares with me family albums, black and white photos from the 30s and the 40s. There are images of family holidays on lakes and mountains interspersed with the occasional swastika or a picture of Adolf Hitler, a haunting photograph of a child taken in the Warsaw Ghetto. The albums make it clear that the Wächter sat at the top Nazi table. There's also an extensive collection of his parents' diaries and letters and Charlotte's reminiscences, but I'll only see these much later. I leave at the end of that first visit over a couple of days, totally intrigued by Horst and his family papers. And the thing is, I like him, as Nicholas said I would. A year passes. I write a profile of Horst for the Financial Times newspaper. He doesn't like it, severs relations, then comes back. The article catalyzes a commission for BBC documentary, My Nazi Legacy, which traces my relationship with Nicholas and Horst and takes us together to the city of Lemberg, Lviv. Horst doesn't like the film either, severs relations again, and then returns again. But one scene in the film really irritates him. In Lviv, in the archive, Nicholas Frank wonders aloud whether Horst could be one of those new kinds of Nazis. He, he retracts that charge later on, but it sticks. Horst wants to counter the claim. I don't think of you as a Nazi, I say to him. You're not a Holocaust denier, you're not an anti-Semite. How can I prove that I'm not a Nazi, he asks. I take a bit of time to reflect on this interesting question. Many of you will know that proving a negative is never easy. Why not give all the family material to a museum, I suggest, so that scholars and others who are interested in your family can review it. It does after all seem to be a unique collection, one that traces the life of a leading Nazi couple from the moment they met in 1929 to the moment Otto died two decades later in Rome. Horst agrees. He offers the material to the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington, where it's digitized and made public. And just two weeks ago, it was made available on the museum's website. So any of you can dip in and take a look. Just type Wächter Holocaust Memorial Museum and you too can look at everything. It's an astonishing collection. Horst said to me back then, would I like a set? Yes, I said I would. And a few days later, a single USB stick dropped through my letterbox in a tatty old envelope. 13 gigs of digital images, 
8,677 pages of letters, postcards, diaries, photographs, newspaper clippings, and official documents. The collection is indeed remarkable. It includes Charlotte's memoirs written for Horst and the couple's five other children after the war, reminiscences grouped by period, 1938 to 1942, 1942 to 1945. Unbelievably, there are also old sound recordings, those old cassette tapes digitized. So I can actually listen to Charlotte in her German cadence, methodical, rhythmic, high-pitched, anxious, not a warm voice, I feel. This amazing material allows me to see the private side of Governor Wächter's terrible work in occupied Poland, in Krakow and Lemberg from 1939 to 1944. What did Wächter do? Why did he travel to Rome in the spring of 49? And what killed him there at a relatively young age of 48? And how much did Charlotte actually know about what he did? And how much did she as a spouse provide by way of support? In fact, what was their re relationship like? The material is voluminous and much of it is handwritten and it's all in German. It lingers for many weeks until one day my colleague, wonderful late historian Lisa Jardine intercedes. She had recently delivered an inaugural lecture at University College London where I teach with a wonderful title, Temptation in the Archives. I love archival material and so does she. How do you assess archival material of a personal nature? That's her question. What's the historical value of personal documents? Lisa has terminal cancer, but she summons a few of us to her flat in the shadow of the British Museum in the heart of London. Bring a few documents, she says. I do. She's interested in the personal correspondence, the diaries. She's struck by the sheer number of letters written in the last months of Otto's life while he was on the run, a hunted man. She asks a question. Why would a husband and wife write to each other so often at such length and in such detail? I don't know, I say because they loved each other? No, Lisa replies. There's more there. They are sharing things that they don't want others to see. The letters from the last years after the war, when Otto was on the run, are coded. There are no names. Focus on the last year of his life, Lisa suggests, and the nature of Charlotte's role. And so begins another research project, one that lasts many years, an, explora an exploration of what lay between the lines and behind the words. I stumble into a world of escape and of espionage, of double dealing and duplicity, of exhumations and reburials, traveling from the Vatican to Syria and South America, even to Albuquerque, New Mexico, into monasteries over lakes across mountains. And finally, I arrive at the world of the rat line, the Reich migratory route, as it was called, the escape path, used by the Nazis to make their way from Italy to Argentina and other places in South America. What I learn is barely imaginable. It's a story of love and lies and justice and injustice, a couple fleeing from the prospect of discovery and arrest, of charge and of trial, of sentencing and the news. At the heart of the story is a relationship, one that survived, the wife Charlotte believed, because our love had no limits and went even beyond death. Those are her words. Charlotte is fascinating and repugnant. She's born into a wealthy family of steelmakers in a small Styrian town, Nutzerschlag, and she was on her own account, a very difficult and highly rebellious child, intelligent, but not intellectual. She enrolled as a student at the Women's Academy of Applied Art and developed a fine artistic eye helped by wonderful teachers such as Joseph Hoffman of the Wiener Werkstätte. Her career blossomed, she designs fabrics, sold them with great success in Germany and Britain. She's also a very fine sportswoman. And in the spring of 1929, she travels to the local Schneeberg ski resort near Vienna and shares a train compartment with a stranger, a strikingly handsome young lawyer. My new baron was tall, slender, athletic, with delicate features, very beautiful hands. He wore a diamond ring on the little finger of his right hand and had a noble appearance, one that any girl would notice. On the 6th of April, 1929, she writes, 
I fell in love with good-looking, cheerful Otto. They court for three years and then they married because she's become pregnant. He starts to practice as a lawyer and he becomes increasingly active in the Austrian chapter of the Nazi party. She supports and encourages his politics. In the summer of 1934, Otto Wächter leads the unsuccessful coup attempt on the government of Austrian Chancellor Engelbert Dolphus. The coup attempt fails, rather like the insurrection on the 6th of January. He flees to Berlin and joins the criminal division of the SD, the Sicherheitsdienst, the intelligence service of the SS. He worked in the same building as Adolf Eichmann. He enters the orbit of Heinrich Himmler, who becomes his patron. Charlotte joins him in Berlin in 1936 with Horst's two oldest siblings. In March 1938, Germany seizes Austria and they're able to return home. Every Nazi felt such a joy about this miracle, Charlotte records. Four years after the failed coup, he's back triumphant. She drives to Vienna to pave the way for her husband's return. There he was in the doorway of my parents' flat in Vienna, a brigade of Führer in his black SS coat with white lapels and uniform, she recalled. In spite of the strain and the fatigue, he looked absolutely splendid. They make their way to the Hofburg Palace through huge crowds overcome with, as she puts it, a spontaneous and heartfelt outburst of joy. Sy Sinkvart and his wife and a number of others came with the Führer, who slowly climbed the stairs of the Hofburg up to the balcony. And there he was, the Führer, standing a metre in front of me. I could see and hear him so well. At the bottom of the stairs, after the joyous event, she tells Otto that he should accept Seisingvart's offer of a job in the new Nazi government. Don't go back to ordinary life as a lawyer. That moment, that decision, will have huge consequences. It changes their lives, as well as the lives of their children and grandchildren. Charlotte's diaries pass in silence on the substance of Otto's new position. As a state secretary, his function is to remove Jews and other undesirables from public office, from the federal transfer at the top to the postal service at the bottom. He axed thousands and thousands of individuals, including, unbelievably, two of his own university teachers, Professor Hupka and Professor Braslov, removed from their university positions in the summer of 1938 both are stripped of their pension rights, both will then be deported and both will die. As Otto crosses lines, Charlotte offers unstinting support. She loves the perks, the Mercedes, the cocktail parties, the concerts at Salzburg and Bayreuth in the presence of the Führer and Himmler. And she loves the new homes, freshly emptied and stolen. In Vienna, they are given a large villa with its own park. Later, on Zell am See, they acquire a small summer house, just 16 hectares, previously owned by the governor of Salzburg, who ends up at the Ravensbrück concentration camp. The arrival of war in September 1939 propels Otto's career to even greater heights and horrors. Seiss Ingvart procures a new position for Otto. He becomes governor of Krakow in Western Poland, newly occupied by Germany, working under Hans Frank. Charlotte was fully aware of what he was up to as he wrote about it in his letters home. And I'm gonna just sh shift now to a um, video screen uh, of uh, a, an extract from a podcast that I made from the BBC, which you can listen to um, completely free on, uh, uh, on, uh, on air if you're interested also called The Rat Line. You may recognize this character. 17th of December, 1939. Dear Chumchen, many thanks for your lovely letter. There's a lot going on here. On the one hand, we've had some lovely things in the last few days. Uh, Schirach, uh, General Arbeitsführer Polenz, uh, RM Funk, and the Philharmonic. Uh, it was a great success, uh, and so also a great success for me. Frank was very impressed. On the other hand, not such nice things. Uh, sabotage, nasty business, car accidents. Ultimately, an attempt on the life of the Governor-General. 
Tomorrow I have to have another 50 poles shot. That you might recognize as the actor Stephen Fry, who reads the letters of Wächter in the podcast. The letters of Charlotte are read by the wonderful American actor, Laura Linney. This act of killing was notorious. It was the first act of reprisal personally ordered by Hitler in occupied Poland. And it was Otto who signed off on it and supervised it. He also signed off on acts against the city's Jews and Polish intellectuals. And it was he who ordered and oversaw the construction of the Krakow ghetto. For these and other acts, he would be indicted by the Americans for mass murder, crimes against humanity and genocide. I looked for a hint of regret in Charlotte's papers, 8,677 pages, not a single sign. Three years later, the Krakow job completed, Charlotte celebrates when Hitler appoints Otto to Lemberg to clean up district Galicia, recently occupied by Germany. Otto keeps her abreast of developments. There was so much to do in Lemberg after you left, he writes. The harvest was gathered. We sent Polish workers to the labor camps, more than 250,000 already in the last few weeks. And the current large Jewish operation, the Juden Aktionen, have been implemented. Lots of love forever, he signs off. Himmler visits, offering him a position in Vienna if he doesn't want to stay in Lemberg. But you know, he decides to stay. I was almost embarrassed about how positively Himmler talks about me, Otto reports to Charlotte. But life isn't perfect. Manual labor proves to be difficult to find because as he writes home to her, the Jews are being deported in increasing numbers and it's so awfully hard to get powder for the tennis court. As the deportations and exterminations proceed, Charlotte writes of picnics and concerts. And it's this disconnect between horror and beauty that makes for so compelling and disconcerting a read in these diaries and letters. Carefully read, the diaries reveal other secrets. Working as a volunteer nurse at a hospital in Lviv, she records in an English that Otto can't read, that she has lost her heart to a young soldier. And in the spring of 1942, exactly as the final solution is being implemented, she actually falls in love with Otto's boss, Hans Frank. I send the pages to Frank's son, Nicholas. Sensational, he writes back, mischievously. Perhaps Horst and I are brothers. The letters trace the last bitter months and weeks of war. Even at the most acute moments, as the Red Army is approaching Lemberg and the end nears, Charlotte and Otto find time to write to each other and to hope. She is ever the Anglophile. The British are so much more nationalist than the Germans, she writes in 1932. Charlotte imagines a new ally in the struggle against the dreaded Soviets. I so hope the English will be fed up and unite with us, she writes. But there is an impediment. The Jews, they're always getting involved, contaminating everything. On 9th of May 1945, the war is over. Otto's indicted for mass murder and he just disappears. His name's in the papers. He's indicted, listed as a wanted war criminal with his friend Seis Inkvart, who is caught, put on trial at Nuremberg, convicted and executed. To survive, Otto now has to rely on Charlotte. The tables are turned, a new chapter opens. Evasion and escape require new friends and allies in the Vatican and beyond. Charlotte's papers provide secret details of Otto's escape, including the time he spent hiding in the Austrian mountains with a young companion, a former SS soldier, Burkhard Ratmann, known as Bucco. I ask Horst about Bucco. What did he do during the war? What was he like? Why did he help your father? You want to know about Bucco? Horst asks. I nod. Well, I can answer your questions and tell you everything about Bucco, he continues. Or we could just telephone him. Unbelievably, in 2017, Bucco Ratman was still alive, 93 years old, and I did visit him. He told me all about how they escaped hid in the mountains for three years, moving from hut to hut, how they followed every day of the Nuremberg trials from a great distance, how they read of the outcome, the convictions, the sentences of death, the hangings of all of Otto's friends and colleagues, Hans Frank, Seisingvart, and Kaltenbrunner. How did Otto react to the news of the hangings? I asked. Vi victis, Bucco said, to the victor 
the spoils. And as Bucco spoke to me, I had my eye on a small black and white photograph on the bookshelf behind him. It was a man seated, pensive, with a swastika wrapped around his arm. It's a photograph of Adolf Hitler in central Germany in January 2017. After Otto left Bucco in the autumn of 48, he made his way south, Salzburg, Innsbruck, across the Dolomites into Italy. The correspondence with Charlotte provides details, the friends and lovers who provide refuge and assistance, the dramatic arrival in Rome, greeted by senior Vatican figures, including a very positive religious gentleman who has connections right to the very top. From this correspondence, which is all anonymized, we eventually work out who he met with and hung out with, what the Americans were up to in Rome, who their new friends and allies were, and how the new war, the Cold War, ensnared Otto, and what exactly the Americans knew about his whereabouts and when. The path to the rat line comes into view, and it's a troubling one. So troubling, in fact, that I took counsel from my neighbor here in North London, the writer of spy novels, John Le Carre. He invites me to tea. I come with six small cakes, a handful of Otto's letters, some photographs. We sit in his living room as the sun streams in across papers laid out on the sofa and a low table. And he says to me, I was there in 1949. I didn't know that, I said. I was a young British soldier and my job was to interrogate Nazis. For what purpose, I asked, to prosecute them? No, he replies, my job was to recruit them. And it was bewildering. I'd been brought up to hate Nazism and that stuff. And all of a sudden, I'm told that we've turned on a sixpence and the great new enemy is the Soviet Union. The Nazis are our friends. It was very perplexing. That was just three years after the end of the Nuremberg trial, which offers a different sort of context. So why did I, an international lawyer, engage in this project? What is it about the Wächters that captured my imagination? There aren't simple answers to these questions, but it seems clear that it goes to the interrelationship of matters of memory and identity. That's the case for Horst, the memorialization and construction of an image of his parents. And it's the case for me too, I suppose, a journey that's taken me back to the untold story of my grandfather so that I can better understand who he was and who I am. My interest in the Wächters is surely a consequence of the connection with my own family from Vienna and Lemberg. Wächter was directly involved in actions that contributed to the extermination of my grandfather's family. My desire to excavate the memories of others is intended to fill gaps and replace silences. And that, of course, is motivated in part by matters of identity. There is too the implication of Otto Wächter's story for our conceptions of justice and for the present. Wächter died alone in the Vatican-run Santo Spiritu Hospital. He was charged, but he was never tried and never convicted. And that fact creates an important space, one that is occupied by his son Horst. All the guilty ones have been judged, he once said to me. As far as he was concerned, the name of those responsible for crimes was fully documented. And since none of the lists of those tried and convicted included his father's name, it followed that he must be an innocent man. Everything else was pure imagination. And that's the untold story of Nuremberg and the untold story of every other expression of formalized international criminal justice. Rwanda, Yugoslavia, Argentina, Chile, Kosovo, and so on and so forth. One of the unintended consequences of more or less every legislative or judicial act. To include one, is to exclude the other. By memorializing certain facts in the Nuremberg judgment, you inadvertently memorialize the acts of others by silencing them. And this allowed Charlotte to live the rest of her life on the constructed and imagined artifice that her husband was actually a very decent man. And that was a reality she passed on to her son. As you will discover, however, in the rack line, the book, The Baton of Innocence, is not passed on endlessly to all future generations. There is too, to explain my interest in the Wächters, the connection of my own work, the cases that I do before international courts and tribunals. A year ago, I pondered these matters. 
I was sitting in the International Court of Justice in The Hague. I was the lead counsel for the Gambia in the case against Myanmar on the Rohingya. You will have been reading about it in the last few days, especially because of events today in Myanmar and the latest coup. In court, I sat literally a few feet from Aung San Suu Kyi, the Nobel Peace Laureate, as she tried to persuade the judges that the Myanmar military's actions against the Rohingya community might be excessive, the odd war crime here and there perhaps, she acknowledged somewhat grudgingly, but they were most definitely not acts of genocide. Not one of the 17 judges was persuaded. How was it, I asked myself, that she could not see the facts as others did? Some who know her believe the reason may lie in matters personal, of family, arising from her relationship with her father, who was the architect of Burmese independence, the founder of the Tat Madur, Myanmar's armed forces, assassinated six months before independence. As she addressed the court, just a few feet from me, looking impeccable, with flowers in her hair, speaking so fluently, I thought of Horst and Charlotte. What about my interest in the Vectors as individuals? I suppose in some way that interest is also connected to the legal issues of crimes against humanity and genocide, the former about individuals, the latter about groups. And if we're on the subject of groups, what group is more important than the family? As regards Otto, I begin the rat line with a quote from the wonderful Spanish writer Javier Cercas. It is more important to understand the butcher than the victim. Why did Otto do what he did? And this is perhaps the big question that I and so many others are chasing. How is it that a highly intelligent, educated, cultured human being could become embroiled in acts of mass murder? Frankly, we are asking ourselves that question now in relation to the, some of the things that are going on in our world and in your world as we watched the storming of the Capitol on the 6th of January, people with t-shirts with words like Camp Auschwitz on them. Why people do things are of course not questions for the judges who are concerned only with what he did and did not do. But can we who are so interested in the formalized delivery of criminal justice also not ask what is surely the bigger question? Why? Warum? Pourquoi? The answers to such questions don't reside in the judgments of courts. They live in the personal archives, in letters and diaries, in poems and notes. In the personal correspondence, we can find clues. My own conclusion is that Vechte crossed lines. One of the big lessons I draw from the book is that once you cross one line, it becomes much easier to cross the next. He was ideological. He was ambitious. He was weak. That is a toxic combination. He was narcissistic. You will be familiar with that. There's another conclusion. His evil is not the banality of evil, to take Hannah Arendt's words, because Otto Wächter knew exactly what he was doing. As the clip from Stephen Fry makes clear, he embraced the horror and the silence of the family documents is testament to their own awareness. What of Charlotte? In many ways, she's the most fascinating of all the characters in the book. She is its beating heart, perhaps also part of the family story of international criminality. It's crystal clear from the archive that she knew everything, that she was complicit, that she embraced everything. She loved her man through everything he did. And what of Horst? He's in a state of absolute denial on that which is in the archive and that which I have dug up. How can we understand the nature of his denial, of his fakery. Love blinds, over time it transforms perceptions of reality and then reality itself becomes a new truth. Like me, Horst was born into a family of silences. When the war ended, he, the Charlotte's favorites, was chosen to be protected, nourished, loved. And he was told that his father was a fine and decent man. I am so grateful that there are still people today who have positive things to say about my husband, she made clear to her son. I don't want my children to believe that he's a war criminal who murdered hundreds of Jews. And today, Horst doesn't want to believe it either, even if he knows the facts point elsewhere. 
Together, he and I stood before a site of mass murder near Lviv, and there the pain on his face was very plain. He doesn't deny what happened. He doesn't deny his father's connection to the horrors. He doesn't deny his mother's support of the father. He just wants to characterize them differently, as Charlotte did. It's a way of being able to live. It's a means of survival, hiding from the truth. That letter that Stephen Fry reads out, tomorrow I have to have 50 poles shot. For Horst, unbelievably, that is proof of the opposite. You see, Horst said to me once, it says, I have to have them shot, not I want to have them shot. You have no proof that he was complicit. That is Horst's interpretation. In the end, I did find the proof. It took three years, and I included three dreadful photographs at the end of the book of Otto Wächter overseeing the act of killing of 50 people. The first photo shows a group of 25 young men and boys in the snow waiting to be shot. A second shows the actual moment of shooting, and a third shows Otto in charge, the commanding presence in that fine, long, black leather coat that Charlotte loved so much. I can't share Horst's characterization of the facts, yet curiously I feel an affection for him. And I respect his open spirit, his willingness to engage in this project with me, to respond to suggestions that looted objects that his mother passed on to him should be returned to their rightful owners. I feel also the anxiety for the price he's paid for sharing with me these personal papers, for allowing me to write this book, cutting himself off as a consequence from so much of the rest of his family. If I'm able to be generous to him, he who protects the reputation of the father who was so deeply involved in the killing of my grandfather's family, it is because I constantly recall a scene early in that film we made together for the BBC, My Nazi Legacy, in April 1945. When he talks about his sixth birthday, he starts to weep. He is a child who has been damaged. He is another victim of horror and of war. The consequences go on. I opened East West Street with a quote from Nicholas Abraham and Maria Torok, the Hungarian psychoanalyst, concerned with the effects on the descendants of injury or catastrophe felt by parents. The last words in this book are spoken by Magdalena, the granddaughter of Otto and Charlotte, the only child of Horst. My grandfather was a mass murderer, Magdalena says to me, and allows me to put the words in the book. For those six words, Horst has disinherited his daughter. Horst and I are bonded by a sense of dislocation and to events in time, distant in time and place. We have different points of departure. We are opposite sides of a shared story, yet our paths crossed and we've somehow arrived at an end point. It's been a most curious waltz. It's been a constant movement, a sort of double act in which each seeks to lead and persuade the other. What emerges from the personal archive are the secrets, the lies, the love, and the absence of justice. What they mean and what they do to memory and identity is another matter, but it's another matter that is deeply relevant to what is going on in our countries today. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for that extraordinary and engaging presentation. It's clear you have traveled a path that very few have traveled, uh, and you have, as a consequence, seen things that very few will see. Maybe we need someone like you to do all the scene for us so we can <laughs> stay behind our screens and, and, and simply chat with you. Uh, so I, I have uh, some questions here. Uh, some have been sent by email, some in the Q&A, uh, so, and I'm trying to combine some as well as that, those that are related. Uh, in your presentation today, as well as in your book, East West Street, you express frustration that genocide as a legal concept has distorted the prosecution of war crimes and crimes against humanity. Can you elaborate a little bit and does your involvement in the dispute concerning Myanmar uh, 
change your views at all or reinforce your views? Sure, yeah, no, I thought about it a lot. I mean, you, you, those who are listening, watching, understand the basic difference now between the two. Crimes against humanity is about the protection of individuals, genocide is about the protection of groups. And over time, we all know that genocide has sort of percolated to the top. It's the crime of crimes in the eyes of many. If an American president says a genocide is happening somewhere in the world, it will be on the front page of every newspaper. If the president says it's a crime against humanity or a war crime, it doesn't even make it into the paper. So it has risen and risen and risen, and that has had unfortunate consequences. It has, I think, reinforced the sense of group identity. And identity politics is something we're all becoming increasingly uh, aware of, particularly you folk in the United States uh, in recent times. Um, and it has meant also that victims of mass atrocity want, I mean, vic prosecutors at the international courts will tell you all victims want their crime to be recognized, or the crime that has been perpetrated on them to be recognized as the worst of all crimes. And that's seen as genocide. And so that has created a very unfortunate situation in which my way of dealing it with it would be to meld the two crimes, but that's not going to happen. There's some magic in the word that Lemkin has invented and it goes on and on, but I, I worry about the consequences because I think it reinforces our sense of group identity and that it may in that way give rise to the very thing it is intended to prevent. We all know every legislative act, every act of legal creation has unintended consequences. And I think this has been one of them. Thank you for that response. Uh, I have a couple of questions relating to your work as the co-chair of the drafting panel uh, on the legal definition of ecocide, which you're doing with the Stop Ecocide Foundation. Uh, how has your work concerning genocide, crimes against humanity, uh, a, a, and with the Rome Convention, uh, or how is that playing a role in, in what you're doing in trying to create uh, a framework for ecocide? A great, a great deal, I would say. Thank you for those questions. Um, yeah, Chris, we go back 30 years, and that's it was lovely that you reminded it. One of the things I feel deeply connected with and proud of is the work in uh, that we were involved in in the creation of the Center for International Environmental Law now in Washington DC and its extraordinary work on protecting, trying to protect the global environment. So when I wrote East West Street, you know, I really didn't know about the story of Lauterpacht and Lemkin. And I thought it was extraordinary that in 1945, they who had fled to Britain and the United States respectively, Lauterpacht and Lemkin, didn't know about the fate of their families. And they could have done what many people did understandably, which is to curl up in a corner and weep, but they didn't. They got up, shook off the dust and put their formidable intellectual efforts into creating new legal concepts to try to stop the horror from happening. Lauterpacht puts crimes against humanity into international law. Lemkin puts genocide into international law. And you and I know that right now there is another horror that is underway, which is the horror of environmental mass destruction, the loss of biodiversity, the loss of species, the change of the climate, the loss of the polar ice caps, the consequences, we don't even know what they're going to be. But international law has no crime in relation to this act, in relation to those who knowingly or by turning a blind eye permit some of these horrors to occur. And it may be that we unwittingly ourselves are involved in some of these things. And when I was approached by Stop Ecocide and I had not been involved in the work, just um, 
three months ago and asking me whether on the basis of East West Street, a book on the origins of genocide and crimes against humanity, uh, I'd be willing to chair a working group to try to define a new crime of ecocide, which could then be inserted into the statute of the International Criminal Court. I did not hesitate for a millisecond. Absolutely. It's inspired by Lauter Pact and Lemkin at one end of the spectrum. And at the other end of the spectrum, it's inspired by my kids who get excited when I do something like this and who want me to do it. I feel we have, my generation, a responsibility to do that. And so in part, it's a sense of responsibility. My generation has not done such a good job in making sure that the ecosystem and the environment is handed over to next generations in good shape. So it's the least I think that I can do. I'm not starry eyed about international law. Just as genocide didn't stop mass murder, ecocide is not going to stop environmental despoliation. But in some cases, it will make sure that justice is done. You mentioned in your last question, the case I'm doing on the Rohingya. It was very moving to be in the Peace Palace uh, in The Hague at the International Court of Justice a year ago with a group of Rohingya men and women, very young people, women in particular who had been sexually abused, raped, treated just abominably, and find that they were in court to see Aung San Suu Kyi effectively in the dock, ask, seeking to defend the indefensible, but that there was a process underway and the eyes of the world had through the prism of the law settled on the horrors as described in a courtroom. So it's not gonna stop the horrors, but it's a way of stopping perhaps some of them. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, so a question dealing with uh, ongoing human rights violations in Latin America. So historically the influence of neo-Nazi ideology in Latin America has contributed to widespread violations of human rights. What is the place of international law in contributing to uh, democratic institutions and respect for the rights of indigenous people in that part of the world? Well, I'd say, Chris, the world is divided in the answer to that question. There are people like me and probably you who believe international law has an absolutely crucial role to play. It has a sort of civilizing effect. That you have to move to a place in which states, governments, individuals are not free to do whatever they want. And that was the significance of 1945. I mean, that was an extraordinary thing. People forget that before 1945, a state was free to treat its citizens exactly as it wished. There was no human rights. There was no crimes against humanity. There was no genocide. And that was what was so remarkable about the contribution of Presidents Roosevelt and Truman. They led the world in changing that. And that, you know, I don't want to get party political on any of this, but that's what was so distressing about what's happened in more recent times with an American president who's basically just shredding the multilateral arrangement uh, and uh, seeking to go back, if you like, to a time where there were no constraints, no limits on what a state could do as a matter of international law. So my simple answer to that vitally important question, and this is particularly for the students who are watching, international law matters, international law matters, and you are part of the generation that needs to defend the system of international law and make darn sure that those who are seeking to destroy the values that many of us care about do not get away with it. It's very interesting for me that the first act of the new administration in the United States, President Biden and Vice President Kamala Harris, was to re-engage with the international, to rejoin the Paris Climate Accord, to rejoin the World Health Organization. This was symbolically for me extremely important. America plays an absolutely leadership role in these kinds of issues. And I want America pushing and pulling on the promotion of international law, not pulling at the seams and unraveling it. Thank, thank you for that. Uh, regarding, so here's a question about 
it's kind of a multidisciplinary question regarding crossing lines and international justice. Why is it in your view that despite the fact that the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change has told us that decisions of our leaders uh, are knowingly and definitely leading to hundreds of millions of, of, of deaths, uh, so little discussion of consequences, legal responsibility is also, why is that not happening? I, I mean, again, what I say to my students um, is that international law tends to follow, not to lead. Uh, and I've always thought, and I still think, that it is only on the cusp of absolute disaster that those kinds of legislative and responsibility acts will cut in. Um, we saw it, as you and I know, Chris, the Montreal Protocol on ozone depleting substances. It was in the face of shocking evidence about what would happen if we did not get rid of certain aerosol sprays and, and other things that the world acted. And what it showed is the world is actually capable of acting. And I think we're getting pretty close to that now on climate change. And I think that it is very striking to see the energy with which the Biden administration has committed to action on climate change. And I mean, there are major developments taking place now and Britain has announced a phase out of all uh, gas powered cars by 2030. I think it's too late. It needs to be earlier, but this is now happening and we are shifting to a completely different paradigm. But of course, what we understand is we can't do it alone. We have to do it with other countries. It's the same with COVID. We're all in this together. The idea um, that the environment or the virus sort of respects national boundaries is a nonsense. And that brings us back to an earlier question. You've got to have international mechanisms for dealing with these challenges. You, countries cannot deal with them on their own. And uh, the framework is rudimentary. Again, for the students among you, it is for you to help construct the new order because without that, it's not going to get better. So I have a couple of questions returning us to uh, our uh, to, to Vector and, and other Nazis on the run. Uh, so did you find evidence of collaboration between the United States intelligence services and, and Vector? Uh, and then perhaps a little bit more broadly, are there reasons beyond uh, the, the West wanting to use Nazis uh, vis-a-vis -vis the, the Soviet Union that allowed uh, many of these Nazis to, in many cases, hide in plain sight. Right. No, I mean, I'll say a little bit about it. I don't want to give too much away. This is sort of spoiler <laughs> alert because it is, the book is, is written as something of a sort of thriller style in terms of uncovering what happens. I was, the word in London is gobsmacked. Uh, I'm not sure that that, exists as a word in Oregon, but um, stunned by what I came across. I was helped by some extraordinary American academics, David Kurtzer at Brown University, won a Pulitzer Prize for a couple of his books, uh, Professor Norman Goda at the University of Florida, who was so generous in, I mean, he's the country's leading expert on CIA and counterintelligence corps archives from the post-war years. I'd never have been able to find my way through all this stuff without Norm. And I was stunned by what I discovered, which was unbelievably, to just give you one example. In 1947, uh, a man called Thomas Lucid, whose son features heavily in the book, lives in Albuquerque, New Mexico, uh, a man called Thomas Lucid was charged by the United States Army to set up something called Project Los Angeles. And Project Los Angeles was a sort of an anti-Soviet spy ring. And it, it recruited nine agents uh, to help uh, in the anti-Soviet activities in Italy. Who were the nine? Well, the chief agent was a Nazi SS mass murderer who became... Uh, an agent for the United States. And he recruited eight sub-agents. Who were the sub-agents? There were three more Nazis, very senior, SS. There were three members of the Italian fascist party, one of whom was actually the secretary general 
of the Italian fascist party imprisoned for illegal activity, but at the same time, an American agent. And the other two, perhaps most remarkably of all, were senior officials in the Vatican. One was the bishop who helped Otto Wechter, and the other was, wait for it, the chief press spokesperson of Pope Pius XII. All of these people were on retainers, $50 in cash a month for four and a half years. Now, I'm asked a lot, did the Pope know about this? I don't, and the answer is, I don't know. I have no idea. Uh, I speculate, I have a sense, because I think it's unlikely that two of his senior uh, if you like, subalterns would be engaged and he would know nothing about it. But I don't know, it's not proven, it's not established. But the simple point is how extraordinary that just four years after the end of the war, the Americans and the British, the Le Carre part of the book makes it very clear that the British were completely implicated in this also, were recruiting Nazis. And that becomes central to the story of Wechter, who was indicted by the Americans, hunted by the Americans, arrives in Rome. And what we learn is that within eight hours of his arrival in Rome, met by a religious gentleman, the religious gentleman has reported him to his American spymaster, and that spymaster knows where he's living, knows what his fake name is, Alfredo Reinhardt, and does absolutely nothing. In other words, it is reasonable to conclude that the rat line, the escape line for senior Nazis from Europe to South America was done either in the full knowledge of the Americans or at the instruction of the Americans. And that I think is um, disconcerting to say the least. Politics is a filthy, filthy game. Yes. Uh, so this, this might be a good question uh, or the answer will, might be interesting coming from you as someone who has uh, spent a lot of time in the Adolf Hitler archives essentially, uh, but also you're an outsider to US politics uh, in that you uh, are a British citizen. What kind of parallels, if any, huh. you see, you know the question's coming, right? Between Adolf Hitler and, and Donald Trump. Well, I, 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 mean, I mean, I, you know, look, I mean, I mean, I follow it very closely. I'm married to an American. She's a New Yorker. We have three kids. They're all Americans. We have a one student daughter who's a student in California right now living there. So we follow it as closely as anyone. Um, I, I don't think Donald Trump is Adolf Hitler. I think that is not a useful comparator. I, I think he's a different character. Um, I mean, I think he's a demagogue. I think he's a narcissist. I think he's a liar. And Hitler was all of those things. But he's also an incompetent. And, uh, and Hitler was not an incompetent when it came to running government. It was very, very striking uh, to compare how the two men operated. The bigger concern, I think, is are there enough people in the United States today who are supportive of a sort of white supremacist, white genocide type of ideology to cause serious long-term damage. I mean, we all saw what happened on the 6th of January. I thought instantly of Wächter in 1934, leads a coup attempt against the Austrian chancellor. The Austrian chancellor is actually killed in that coup attempt, but the coup attempt fails and Wächter flees. He goes to Berlin and he's back four years later, installed at the upper echelons of government. I think if there's one thing that it's worth watching, you know, I don't know if you've seen it, Chris. I've spent, I've just finished a little article for the New Yorker magazine online about Arnold Schwarzenegger's video statement. I, I don't know if you've seen it. It's, I haven't, it, was, no. it was watched by 45 million people in the first 24 hours. It's extraordinary. And, Vecht, and Schwarzenegger basically says, look, I'm Austrian. I know about all these things. I know how when you cross a line, one thing leads to another. Be very, very careful. 
And of course, Schwarzenegger is a Republican. Schwarzenegger is not a sort of bleeding heart, lefty liberal who's coming from a particular perspective that he's easy to brush away. And that video statement is a very important contribution. He's not saying Donald Trump is Hitler. He's not saying Trump supporters are Nazis. But one thing leads to another. Lines get crossed very quickly and very easily. And I think the United States right now is in a very dangerous and difficult position. And the next four years will be extremely significant uh, as to whether some sort of civility, courtesy, cross-party uh, cooperation can resume to head off what is otherwise likely to be painful and politically very, very damaging. So I'm not terrified, but I am concerned. And um, I think one needs to take very, very great care. History never repeats itself exactly, you know, but there are lessons to be learned from history uh, of what steps need to be taken. And I think that's probably one of the reasons that East West Street, but even more, the rail line has sold in very large numbers in, in the European countries where it's been published so far, because people want to understand how it happens. And they want to know how ordinary, decent, intelligent, cultured, educated folk become mass murderers. I think we're all capable of it, frankly, and we need to take great care. So this question from my colleague, Professor Melissa Powers, I think is a good follow-up to that. Uh, she says, I, I found myself wondering if you think that society's tendency to identify specific individuals as heroes or villains tends to enable human rights violations, right? So do we then allow others to, to hide in the, in the shadows and or justify uh, their behavior based on the conduct of you know, these people that we've identified as the, as the, the evil ones? Yeah, no, one of the things, I never describe Hans Frank or Otto Wächter as evil. Um, I think they did evil things, but here's what's really troubling. They were also very humane, capable of love and generosity and affection and culture and friendship. And this is what's so troublesome is that they're not capable of simply being painted as just awful human beings. This. This is, the, this is what is so troubling about reading the letters and the diaries is that literally on the same day that he comes home from ordering the deaths of tens of thousands of people, he'll go to a concert, he'll have dinner, at a, he'll have a dinner party with his wife, he'll go for a walk in a botanic garden. It's the mundanity that is so troublesome. And of course, Vesta's name was whitewashed out of history. His wife succeeded in taking the spotlight off him. And that has enabled the family to occupy a particular space. And I think that we are only capable of societies as focusing on a small number of individuals who become emblematic. And we then can't see the great mass that is taking place. Um, so I don't know whether our focus reinforces the tendency to human rights violations, but it is possible that by focusing excessively on particular individuals, we lose sight of the bigger picture. Um, and the bigger picture now is, yeah, sure, you know, some of us will focus on Donald Trump, but 70 million people voted for him. That is a stunning number, I have to say, <laughs> given some of the things he was stood for uh, and was saying. Now, those 70 million are not all awful people. Some of them are, most of them, I'm sure, are decent, ordinary, good folk. But amongst that 70 million, there will be many, many bad eggs. And how we keep tabs on what they get up to, I do not know. That is a real issue. You know, Trump is pretty old. I think it's unlikely that he will be back in four years' time. The question is, who is out there to emerge 
as the charismatic, because he has charisma, he has stage presence. He's a great speaker, he G's people up. Who's the next one who's gonna come along capable of doing that? That's the big question. Uh, so I often tell my students that it's incredibly easy to practice environmental law, international environmental law from the United States. I know lots of lawyers around the world who practice public interest in environmental law, who have had death threats, had their brake cables ripped out of their cars unknowingly, thing, things like this, things that we just don't have to deal with. Has your work on these high profile controversial cases made you feel less safe or have you had any direct threats? I mean, I'm a pretty robust sort of character. Yeah, I've had a few death threats and um, I think that's just par for the course. Um, <laughs> you know, um, living in London, I have to say, I feel pretty safe. Um, there are some parts of the world I will not go to, uh, including some countries, again, that I'm not gonna mention that because of some of the cases that I've done, I will steer clear of, I will not go to those countries. Um, but, but, but certainly in the UK, in the US, in France, I feel, I feel pretty safe. I feel pretty comfortable. Um, but hey, you know, who knows what's lurking around the corner? Um, you never, you never, you never do know. The, the world seems like it's not heading in a good place. Um, and if you take the aftermath of the 2008 economic difficulties, mix in the environmental crisis, add on top a pandemic that is, you know, fueling excessive nationalistic tendencies, including in my own country, I've got to say, Britain. Um, I think it's a worrying combination. Uh, and I think we need to, I've said it, we need to exercise great care. Overall, I tend to be a pretty optimistic person, as you know. But I think it's a difficult moment that we're in now. Um, and particularly if the pandemic is followed by a major economic collapse, which is not impossible. Uh, I think that will then be very, very tough and dangerous. Well, let's see if we can, so we have, we have time for one more question. Uh, hopefully uh, we can end on something slightly positive, maybe very positive. In what ways can we best help the Rohingya uh, from where we sit in the United States or United Kingdom or, or wherever we, we may be? Well, I think you can talk about what's going on and you can write to the ambassador of Myanmar, you know, letters, they really, these people do not like getting letters complaining about what's happening. This is a delicate moment. Um, I think that as you know, the Gambia for whom I act, rather bravely took a case to the International Court of Justice and we persuaded all 17 judges to order provisional measures, um, uh, ordering Myanmar to stop, ordering Myanmar to report, ordering Myanmar to protect the evidence of wrongdoing or allegations of genocide. And uh, I have to say that um, over the last few months, the, there are still real concerns, but in formal terms, Myanmar has complied with the order. And like you, I woke up yesterday to the news of what is happening in Myanmar right now. And I, of course, immediately had an anxiety about what uh, what may be coming. Would Myanmar continue to participate in the case? What was the fate of the Rohingya? So I think this is a moment of maximum attention. And I believe in, you know, writing letters, posting on social media, but write to your congressman or congresswoman, write to your senator and express concerns that this community at this difficult time in Myanmar is not allowed to let slip below know, the radar screen. You know, one of the things that surprised me is all of a sudden the sort of outburst of warm, positive feelings towards Aung San Suu Kyi. Aung San Suu Kyi refuses to refer to the community as Rohingya. If you want to go and look on the website of the International Court of Justice, you can see the exchange where I, with her sitting next to me, say to her, Madam Agent, 
you refuse to call this community by its name. You refuse to um, describe what has happened to citizens of your own country, women, as having been raped. That is not good enough. So I do have a concern that we are maybe about to turn on a sixpence and provide support to someone who has not been a friend of international law uh, or of the Rohingya community. And I think it's a worrying moment. Write, protest, send letters, become lawyers, defend the rights of others. Um, we're in a law school community, a wonderful law school community. Um, law matters and lawyers have a social function. And you, the young lawyers who are on this so webinar now are the ones who will be the guardians of change going forward. So get involved, get involved. Well, thank you so much, Philippe. This has been an absolutely fantastic presentation in the Q&A chat box. People are saying things like marvelous, splendid. <laughs> Very English words. And many, and many other <laughs> positive superlatives. Uh, so thank you so much. Again, a reminder. Uh, that uh, to sh share this, I guess, with with uh, once the link is up on on the law school's YouTube channel, uh, and I assure you, Philippe, if we were in a classroom someplace, uh, you would have lots of people clapping. So we'll just have to see my small clap there and take that as representative of everyone who's been uh, participating today. Thank you, Chris, and thank you so much for inviting me. And I really hope I'm going to be spending time down in California over the next few years visiting my beloved daughter. I really hope I get to come back to Oregon. We've had some fantastic visits to Oregon, and it will be great to see you on what looks behind you like an exquisite campus. We have a fantastic campus. Yeah. We would love to get you here. Thank you so much for the invitation. You're welcome. Thanks to everyone for participating. Bye now.